You may be seated. And good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. I'm Mike Havigan. I'm the Chief Justice of the Nebraska Sup Supreme Court, and we will do this in order of length of service on the court. So we're going to turn toward the WebEx screen. Justice Miller Lerman. Good afternoon. Judge Miller Lerman appearing by WebEx. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, William Castle. Stephanie Stacy. Jeff Funk. John Frydenberg. And uh, Justice Pappick is recused, but we also on WebEx I uh, have uh, from the Court of Appeals, Judge Welch, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Judge Larry Welch, Court of Appeals, joining by WebEx. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. We are here this afternoon for the case of State X Rail McNally versus Evnon. Now, we appreciate everybody uh, following our coronavirus protocol, if, if at all possible, please keep masks on when you are not presenting. When you are presenting, if you are one of the lawyers presenting, please take your mask off so that we can uh, understand, hear and understand what you have to say. Uh, and with that, does anyone have any questions before we begin? Yes, we have a question. This screen does not look the same as that screen. Um, it will. There you go. There's the answer to that. This one is for us. That one is for you. So you should see uh, people speaking. For example, if you have a question uh, from one of the judges on WebEx, you should you should be able to see that, and they can see you. Other questions. With that, let us begin. Mr. Barry, good morning or good afternoon to you. You may approach and you may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court and counsel my name is Andy Berry. I represent the relators in this case. I would like to reserve 10 minutes for rebuttal. The single subject rule in Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution has just seven words. Initiative measures shall contain only one subject. The meaning of those seven words is clear from the decisions of this court. An initiative measure may not contain multiple dissimilar provisions in a single measure presented to voters for a single vote. Each of the three ballot initiatives before the court satisfies this rule. This honorable court has now received briefs from the Secretary of State, two sets of interveners, and an amicus in opposition to the ballot initiatives. Those briefs total 122 pages, not counting signature pages. They spend their 122 pages trying to wring new meaning out of these seven words. They fail because it cannot be done. In 122 pages, there is not one citation to a decision of this court grouping together separate measures for purposes of the single subject rule. In 122 pages, there is not one decision of this court judging a measure's compliance with the single subject rule based on its effect on federal law, or any collateral effect for that matter. In 122 pages, there's not one citation to a decision of this court or any other court keeping a constitutional initiative off the basis, off the ballot on the basis of voter confusion, period, let alone one based on voter confusion that did not arise from what the single subject rule actually prohibits, which is multiple provisions in the same measure presented for a single vote. What this court has held repeatedly and as recently as the last general election, is that the right of initiative is precious to the people. It is one which the courts are zealous to preserve to the fullest tenable measure of spirit, as well as letter. 
a peremptory writ of mandamus should issue to preserve this precious and fundamental right of all the people. I'd like to begin with the issue of tribal gaming, because the most significant argument before the court is that the constitutional initiative would be a hidden authorization of tribal gaming. And this claim is wrong for two reasons. First, the constitutional initiative does not authorize tribal gaming. And second, any collateral effects that the constitutional, constitutional initiative may have on tribal gaming are not hidden. They're visible in plain sight. To begin with, the constitutional initiative does not authorize any games of chance, even within the state of Nebraska. It simply removes a constitutional barrier to the legislature's doing so. That's significant because under IGRA, there actually has to be something in state law which authorizes games of chance, and the constitutional amendment does not do that. There must be some subsequent legislative act, either by the state legislature or the people of Nebraska. And without such an act, uh, even if there were a legislative act in the constitutional initiative, that's not enough, uh, well, that, that, that legislative act would be necessary to trigger IGRA. And so for that reason alone, there's no authorization of tribal gaming in the constitutional initiative. Is this a substantive issue or a procedural issue? I, I don't understand the question, I think, Your Honor. Perhaps I don't understand. Um, is, is this an issue ripe for review at this point? Well, I think the issue of what the scope of the effect of, if you take the constitutional initiative and assume that that is enacted, and then the regulatory initiative and assume that that is enacted, what effect that would have on tribal law, I don't think that is a justiciable issue for the court. I think that involves application of laws to fact that go beyond this court's analysis for purposes of the single subject rule. Is, it, is that what you're getting at in your question? Thank you, yes. Okay, thank, thank you, Your Honor. But even if the constitutional initiative did authorize games of chance, it would only do so as a matter of Nebraska law. And Nebraska cannot, cannot legislate for Indian tribes. It can't legislate regarding Indian gaming on Indian lands. The U.S. Supreme Court has been clear that Congress has plenary and exclusive jurisdiction to legislate regarding gaming in Indian country. So any effect is on... Is the state obligated to negotiate with the uh, Indian tribes once uh, gambling is approved in Nebraska? So there's two steps before you get there. You'd have to have a constitutional initiative removing that constitutional barrier and then some authorization of gaming within class three gaming. And then under IGRA, there would be some obligation to negotiate. Um, what, th what would come out on the other end of that negotiation is not before the court. And we have in fact some, already some agreement with uh, one of the Indian tribes, is that correct? So there's a compact there, and I'd be interested to hear what the Attorney General has to say about that compact. It, it dates back to 1990. It was signed by the Tax Commissioner. It says it becomes effective upon approval by the state of Nebraska, So I don't, which apparently is something in addition to the Tax Commissioner signing it. To my knowledge, we don't have any evidence that that was ever done. It also says it becomes effective upon publication in the Federal Register. I haven't seen any evidence that that has happened. So, whether that's a valid compact or not, I think is maybe a question for the Attorney General. And I wouldn't be surprised if the state of Nebraska, 30 years after that compact was enacted, and, and by the way, it doesn't have any termination provision either, that the state, it's up to the Attorney General, but the, but the state of Nebraska may, may take the position that's, that that's not an effective compact. I just don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, but your question goes to a larger point, which is the lack of any hidden authorization. That compact is a matter of public if, record. If I may, if I yes. may in interrupt, I beg your, beg your pardon, but to clarify the last answer, is this um, your view of the compact, quote unquote, such as it is, doesn't spring into effectiveness if the voters were presented with the constitutional authorization and voted for it? That, is that your position? That's right. If it were, if, even if the even if the compact were currently effective, and that compact governs class two gamings by, it, by its terms, and I'm not even sure if it's being followed with regard to class two games in Nebraska, but let's assume that it were in place and being followed and effective, simply enacting the constitutional amendment would not trigger the compact. There would have to be some subsequent legislative act to authorize specific class three games that would be covered by the compact. 
Uh, all right, and so that dovetails then with your arguments, which are all under this umbrella of the, our, the secretaries and this court's pre-election scope of duty. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Thank you for your question. The, but all, all of this points out that there's no hidden authorization of Indian gaming. That, that compact is a matter of public record. Um, the fact that there's gaming on Indian reservations is a matter of public record. There's class, it, it's a matter of common knowledge. There's class two Indian gaming in Nebraska on Indian reservations already. There's class three games in other states. All of the arguments about possible effects on gaming in Indian country are set forth in detail in the briefs that the court has received in this case. Those briefs are a matter of public record. This action is a matter of public record. The arguments in the case are, are uh, being broadcast on NET and this is being covered by the media and the court will issue a public decision. There's no hidden authorization of Indian gaming. There are some fears expressed in the briefs on the other side about what Indian tribes may be able to do on Indian lands if the constitutional initiative passes, but the single subject rule doesn't concern itself with what may happen under the laws of a separate sovereign. It's concerned with Nebraska law. What are the standards of the single subject uh, rule? What are, we, what are we to concern ourselves with? The test under the single subject rule is the natural and necessary connection test. And the, the point of that test is to judge that the, the court is, has made clear that it's not improper for there to be uh, more than one provision in a ballot initiative. The question is, do those have a natural and necessary connection to each other? And what this court held in Christensen is that connection doesn't mean, the word necessary in that rule doesn't mean absolutely necessary. It doesn't mean strictly necessary. It means, is there a natural relationship between these two things? And so, and I think Christensen, as we've explained in our briefs, provides the best uh, example that we have in the current precedents of this court about, about what that means. So in this case, um, you have uh, the constitutional initiative, which the subject of that is to remove a constitutional barrier to the legislature's authorization of gaming. Um, and the provisions of that are all clearly related to that. The, the only question for purposes of the single subject rule as a matter of state law is whether it violates the single subject rule to limit that power to racetracks. But racetracks are part of gaming. They've been part of gaming in the, they're games of chance at, under the decisions of this court, court. They've been part of gaming in Nebraska for a long time. And the public policy reasons for limiting uh, expanded gaming to specific locations, so there's not a casino on every corner or a, or a slot machine in every gas station, um, it's a reasonable public policy purpose to limit it to some facilities. And we already have facilities in Nebraska where regulated gaming takes place. That's a, that satisfies a natural and necessary connection test. Council, you've been describing our jurisprudence on, uh, on the single subject rule as clear. And I've spent the last several days reading it and I'm, I have a little different perspective on it. Is, is there a point at which our jurisprudence on the single subject rule becomes so complex that it can no longer fairly be characterized as ministerial and it becomes a judicial decision just by necessity. That, that is your question that there has to be some level of discretion involved in whether, it, whether a ballot question meets the single subject Based rule? Based on how we have phrased the, symbol, the single subject jurisprudence and the test that we've applied. Well, I, I would hesitate before saying it involves a matter of discretion. I would say that one, one aspect of the single subject rule is you have to define what the subject is. And, the, and the course, this court's decision in state X rel Luncher versus Gale sort of grapples with that, that you, know, you, can, you can define the subject at different levels of abstraction and that, that's going to help determine whether the different provisions are related to each other or not. And there's a degree if of- I, If I may it jump in with respect to the, sweep of our exercise and that of the secretary. Uh, perhaps Justice Stacy is looking at our opinion um, and whether or not the 
exercise for the secretary and the exercise for us is single subject. N not is it confusing, not is it misleading, none of those things that were attributed to considerations of initiatives uh, at the municipal level, which just to frame it are, if I'm not mistaken, uh, undertaken pursuant to statute, which may or may not welcome more common law, whereas here we're looking at a constitutional provision and those other features that may be useful in assessing an initiative at the municipal level, uh, I'm not sure they've ever been endorsed. Rather, they've just been mentioned in the Luchner 2014 opinion. Do you have a comment on the scope of our exercise and that of the Secretary? Thank you. I, I, th thank you, Your Honor. I do, and I, I tend to agree with, with, I think, what you're suggesting in that question. Going back to what I said at the beginning of my argument, we have seven words in Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution. In Nebraska, we follow the plain language of the Constitution. Those seven words don't say anything about voter confusion. Um, and if you go back and look at this court's decisions, what it actually decided, not just what it said, but what it actually decided on constitutional initiatives, it's never withheld a constitutional initiative from the ballot based on voter confusion. I guess what I would say is, there might be some room in the rule for voter confusion that's a direct result of two different measures. I mean, you've got two different provi provisions and they're connected with an or, and nobody knows which one of those two has actually been adopted and what, and what the executive branch or whoever's gonna carry out this law is actually gonna do. That's one type of confusion that I think is tied to the single subject rule. But the type of confusion that's being argued about in this case that well, this is straightforward, but someone may not really understand how it might apply to a specific set of facts or how it might interact with federal law. None of that's reflected in the seven words in the Constitution or the actual decisions of this court. Can confusion be tied to the concept of law growing? And does law growing have anything to do with these initiative petitions we're talking about today? Um, so there's you know, two, two different questions, uh, Your Honor. I think when it comes to log rolling, the way the court has defined log rolling is presenting distinct provisions in the same measure for a single vote. Um, and so I'm not sure that confusion has anything to do with that definition of log rolling, where you're maybe trying to get people who support one thing on board with this other one by combining them in the same measure. Everybody at least knows that you have to have both of those things. And I haven't canvassed all of the descriptions of log rolling all over the United States to see if there's maybe a different provision, but some maybe a kissing cousin to that would be, okay, we're gonna have a provision that says, we'll give you X, or maybe Y, you have to vote on it to find out which one of these two it is. Um, those two separate provisions in the Constitution, that's not what the court has defined as log rolling, but that might be a form of confusion that the single subject rule um, is designed to ferret out and prevent. Mr. But that's not what we have here. Mr. Berry, what is the, na I know you've alluded to this, but what is the natural and necessary connection between authorizing all forms of games of chance and licensed racetracks? Suppose we had an initiative that said all forms of games of chance may be allowed at any convenience store. Would that be a single subject? I think that would still be a single subject, Your Honor, because it's simply providing a location for the games of chance. So, so the voter who might be in favor of expanded games of chance but doesn't want one on every corner What's their choice? Well, it, at some point, you have to, the choice is to vote yes or no for this, for this provision, Your Honor. But this is, this is exactly the question that came up in the, in the Christensen case. It's the voter who would like to expand access to Medicaid, but doesn't want to involve federal dollars for that for some reason. And there were, and there were a lot of policy arguments against that. I suspect your opponents are going to get up and distinguish the Christensen case, and I'd like to give you the chance to get a, a head start sure. on, on uh, saying why this one is 
is more similar to Christensen than to Lunger one. Right. Well, and I, and the reason I would say that it is, it falls squarely within uh, Christensen is what the argument that that the opponents have made in various different ways is that um, casino style gaming has nothing to do with horse tracks other than that they're both gaming. In the first place, I think that's sufficient here under the Christensen standard. The, the overall primary purpose of the constitutional amendment is to expand gaming. So that, that alone is, is enough if you take that on its face. But that's- I beg, I beg your pardon, is the, is the object to provide an exception to the prohibition on the games of chance and the, that exception would be games of chance at the racetrack. I, I, is, that, is that what's on the table? Yes, thank that you, one, Your Honor. Is that, I, one, is that one thing? And perhaps another year there could be a menu games of chance at the corner or games of chance sold at the food truck or something. That's, that's right, Your Honor. That is, is, that is correct. Is it unusual to have a constitutional provision giving a business an exclusive right to an entire market? I don't think that is without precedent if you go through the Nebraska Constitution, particularly if you look at, at some of the constitutional amendments on gaming. You, at least you have some very specific Can Can you provision. give me an example of another one in Nebraska that I may have? I guess off the top of my head, I can't. Okay. I can't give a specific example of one. I guess what I would what I would respond to on that though is the single subject rule. That that may be a policy argument against it, but the single subject rule doesn't say initiative measures can't support specific types of businesses. It's limited to it whether there's one subject or not. But it comes down to if it's two questions instead of one, correct? Right, but I, but but simply because there might be someone whose whose interests are promoted doesn't doesn't change that. And I guess I would add that um, in any constitutional amendment, somebody has an interest that they're promoting. You know, it may be more or less altruistic, but someone has an interest because it's expensive to put something on the ballot. Does that, um, does that examination put us into motive and uh, start to get into a substantive rather than a procedural inquiry? I agree with that, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to reserve some time for rebuttal, but I want to come back to Justice Castle's question before I sit down. Um, when you look at the purpose of this, which is to remove an obstacle to legislative authorization of games of chance, those games of chance have to take place somewhere. And um, it's a reasonable policy to say, we're going to limit where they take place. Um, and it's a reasonable policy choice to say, we're going to limit where they take place to locations where gaming already occurs and where it's already licensed and regulated. And I think that falls comfortably within the court standard in Christensen. I would like to reserve uh, my time for rebuttal unless there are other questions that need to be addressed right now. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you very much. Mr. Lopez, good morning to you, and you intend to take how many minutes? Uh, 10, Mr. Chief Justice, and thank you. Uh, let me give the court a roadmap of what our order of presentation will be. Uh, I intend to address jurisdiction and the constitutional initiative. Mr. Spray will address the regulatory and tax initiatives. And then Mr. Campbell from the Attorney General's office will uh, back clean up and address everything that was addressed by the Secretary of State. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Um, I certainly want to reserve about half of my time for the merits, but let me, let me touch off on jurisdiction because we have mounted a jurisdictional challenge here, um, part of which may have been cleaned up with the intervention by the other sponsors, but our lead-off jurisdictional argument is that 32.14.12 stands as a plain and adequate remedy for a pre-election legal sufficiency challenge to an initiative, to a voter-initiated initiative or referendum measure that should either either defeat jurisdiction in this court under Article 5 or simply serve as a plain and adequate enough remedy such that mandamus cannot be issued here and so the practical result would be the same. It's two lanes to the same off-ramp. The, the second half of that, however, is not a jurisdictional argument. That's it's correct, Justice Council. Right. So we've presented it as a collapsed jurisdictional argument. 
um, simply because we, we viewed Article 5 as the grant of this court's original jurisdiction. And so, you know, the, the thinking goes that if there is some reason why that particular aspect of the mandamus available of the mandamus option for original jurisdiction this court is defective then it stands as a jurisdictional defect the legislature by statute cannot deprive this court of its original jurisdiction you correct agree with that proposition I do. I do so in reality you're relying on the second prong not really the jurisdictional part it gets us to the same practical place though and and what i would add is that in luncher versus gale you made very clear, and you, you went out of your way to mention it, that you were following the traditional statutory rules for whether mandamus could issue. And among them is whether there is a plain and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of the law. Here, my position is simply that 32.14.12 is exactly it. Uh, this is a tailor-made statute. Th this is a tailor-made statute for pre-election ballot sufficiency challenges. Mr. Berry, hinting in his in his application for leave, hinted at why it is that it wouldn't be possible to first make a stop in district court, but there's a couple different problems with that. One, 1412 is built for speed. They put an acceleration, and an automatic advancement provision in it. They included an accelerated appeal deadline, uh, all of which are the sorts of things that you would expect to see for, some, for a, a remedy that you're gonna need at the 11th hour, as we've seen in the last couple weeks, with these last minute ballot sufficiency challenges. If we were to take that path now, there would be no time to meet even those accelerated deadlines, would there? Well, let me let me take issue with that, Justice Castle, in two ways. One, I'm not convinced that that's true. And of course, if, it, 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 if there's a defect in my friend Mr. Berry's ability to obtain mandamus, I don't know that it matters. But, but let, me, let me address two different ways I think that that's incorrect. One, you don't have to take my word for it that 32.14.12 is an adequate remedy. Two other challengers to the payday lending measures filed their suits in Lancaster County District Court, I think on Friday, and then another one rolled in a couple of days ago on Monday. So clearly they think it's available. Um, I think substantively, I don't wanna take so much away from the District Court of Lancaster County and its ability to issue uh, pretty quick rulings on this and have the opportunity if any party sees fit to develop a factual record in service of their legal sufficiency claims or defenses to be able to do that there and get docketed in this court in time. Um, so I, I, I will, I'm, I'm gonna stand on my ground that I think district court really is substantively not a bad place to be, even moving at speed. Are there any factual questions in this case? Uh, we, we have not advanced any, but if we did have any, let's say we wanted to focus on developing a factual issue on the multiple games as multiple subjects issue. Um, this court is appropriately reluctant to be a fact-finding venue um, and has recently uh, disposed of, of original actions where parties could not reach factual stipulations. Um, and so I, I think for a party who finds themselves here without an opportunity to do record development, they could be stuck. But I do want to I do, I do return to the second half of your, of your question, Justice Castle, and that is, does it matter if they ran out of time? I don't want to concede any any point that in the future we might want to make that would, without a conclusive ruling from this court that they wouldn't need to go and start from scratch on their petition. But there are statutory indicators both in 32.14.12 sub 1 in the last sentence and in several of your pro, uh, previous cases, the Lebed's case from 1988, uh, which cites Barclay versus Poole going all the way back to 1918, that demonstrates and indicate that the judicial process on legal sufficiency issues pre-election should take as long as it takes. Um, so again, I concede nothing on whether, whether the relators, if it, let's say they were obta to obtain a win on legal sufficiency sometime next year because we had to go back to district court and litigate this from there, that they would not need to start over. I'm just saying, the statute itself presupposes that there could be a, a rollover to the next election. And so I, 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 for all of those reasons, but mainly because the District Court of Lancaster County really is equipped to deal with these, and that's borne out by the fact that we have multiple other challengers going there, um, 32.14.12 serves as a plain and adequate remedy. Um, with, the, with the four minutes I have left. I, I beg your pardon, it's 
plain and adequate, but is, is your argument it's necessary? The, yes, from the standpoint that the legislature has seen fit to tailor this, this statute with all the attributes of what you would need for an 11th hour, and even an 11th hour legal sufficiency challenge coming in the last week before, or even three weeks, which is when the relators filed, uh, before the certification deadline. If I so could, we yeah. did that pass, <clears throat> pardon me, in, recently in Christensen v. Gale, right? That started at the district court. Mm -hmm. um, and that petition was filed on July the 9th. So we're not, we don't have the luxury of time in, under the certain circumstances, whether or not that's an excuse or just color. Uh, that's a different timeline for what it's worth. And my response to that would track with what I said to Justice Castle, Justice Miller Lerman, which is that I, I'm not convinced that the law does not allow for the judicial process to go beyond the certification deadline. Um, and and then if there's and then the legal sufficiency finding rolls over to another election. Right. But in Christensen, we had Judge uh, uh, Edith's opinion. So, uh, but they had she had uh, six weeks to inform us. I, <laughs> I make no defense of the time. I mean, the statute is devoid of some <laughs> deadlines here that would help. Well, but for, for what it's worth, thank right. you. If I could move to the merits briefly, um, I want to first address the colloquy with Justice Stacy and Justice Miller Lerman with, with my friend. Um, the standards that speak to deception and voter confusion and post election doubt are not new as of state ex rel luncher. They have existed in the common law of single subject, of, of single subject rule jurisprudence uh, for as long as there's been a single subject rule. Um, there's also no reason to read them out of the standard just because they originated in Nebraska jurisprudence at the municipal level. This court acknowledged in state ex rel luncher that it would be an odd thing for there to be more protection for municipal measures than there would be for amending the Constitution. Um, so I would I would certainly caution the court well, against. When you say it goes back many years in Nebraska law, it goes back, or what are you making reference to? Well, if you look at if you look at, for example, in the municipal context, um, in Munch and in other in in, in the other municipal uh, legal sufficiency and single subject cases, you have similar rules for voter confusion for voter confusion and deception. Also. If you look I beg at your pardon, but that does go back to my comment with respect to the potential distinction jurisprudentially between the municipal setting and our little constitutional pigeonhole. So right. North Platte and Drummond and all of those, I think, are all driven out of the municipal context, are they not? Yes. So, Justice Miller-Lerman, two, two answers on that. One. I think you answered the question in Luncher versus Gale. You, you imported that standard, and for very good reason. Because as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, it would be odd for this court's jurisprudence to offer more protection to voters against single subject violations for municipal measures than it would be for amending the state constitution. So I think those standards, I, I don't think they're unadministrable. I think they make perfect sense, especially in cases like this, where, uh, you absolutely have a second subject that is fundamentally inconsistent and diametrically opposed to what Mr. Barry himself and the relators have defined as the subject here, which is authorizing all games of chance on racetracks. So even if, and I, I, I want to make two quick points. One, assuming that the authorization of games of chance at racetracks or the removal of the prohibition under Article 3, Section 24, is enough to trigger IGRA. And we have a fundamental disagreement with, with Mr. Berry on whether it does. If you look at Justice uh, Judge Battalion's 2006 Santee Sioux decision, which, is, which is, uh, is mentioned in our brief, it very clearly says, further IGRA allows a tribe to authorize Class 3 gaming if the state regulates as opposed to prohibits the gaming. I think in this case, we're doing away with the prohibition. So I think that's enough to trigger to trigger the IGRA privilege for, for a tribe. In that case, I do not see how you can honor the two other prongs of the luncher test on voter on, on whether it would confuse the voter or create doubt post-election as to what's been legalized uh, 
given the fact that there would be an automatic result of something polar opposite of what the voters thought they were green lighting. But let me, let me make it easier, because even if we're wrong, even if the constitutional initiative only lifts the safety but doesn't pull the trigger, and that something else would have to happen, whether it's the, the uh, regulatory initiative that Mr. Spray will address in a moment, or something else by the legislature. We live in a world right now where the people know that they have a constitutional protection against all games of chance statewide from Panhandle to River, okay? If the constitutional initiative passed, they would think that they were entering a world where they are removing that protection from the legislature doing something for everywhere except for, for, for racetracks. So it remains deceptive. The, the, the thing that is, that is subsumed and hiding and coiled in the folds, as, Judge, as Justice Wright said in, Lucha versus, in his concurrence in Lucha versus Robinson, is the authorization, the automatic authorization, which we do control and have say over as a state under IGRA and under Nebraska law 91106, by resulting in something diametrically opposed from what the, uh, a protection that is diametrically opposed from what is now authorized on tribal, on, on tribal lands. And I think under if either- the, If the law is recited in Luchner, um, I'm losing my place as to which number, 2014, did not fully import the municipal principles, recited them and then went with single subject and did not, uh, say uh, that the standard for the secretary and or the court was confusion and or, mis or misleading, then you would just be back to simple single subject traditional jurisprudence. A am I right? That's true, Justice Miller Lerman. And even if we were there, if you look to Mr. Berry's citations to even California single subject law from the 80s and the 70s, it all says the same thing. It's all germaneness and 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 relation and, and, and voter confusion issues. I mean, those but elements. But Jermaine is, is, is that, that takes place in the other branch down the hall. <laughs> um, right, but, right. But, right. Uh, but the question becomes, is, is confusion and misleading an appropriate consideration in a pre-election environment, or is that a matter of persuasion if there were something on the ballot? And I say that because now, maybe circling back to where Justice Stacey was going with her questions about our jurisprudence in the scope, then would we be asking a little bit much of the secretary, is this a single subject? And then he or she would say, well, it's confusing, as opposed to can you count to one? So would, would we have expanded the role of the secretary before elections? And, and us, as, us as well, we're, we're all trying to stay and perform our, our duty, no more. Thank so you. So let me answer that, and then I want to be respectful of Mr. Spray's time. Um, I, I absolutely think there's nothing inconsistent about continuing to honor the voter, con the, the voter confusion requirements and post-election doubt requirements that are already in the court's law. I don't think that's inconsistent at all with just a baseline single subject analysis. And in any event, as we've described, it violates the single subject rule since it brings in something that is a separate subject from what he's defined that is diametrically opposite of what they're asking of the voters. So on a single subject, could the voters potentially just say legalize games of chance, period, and then that would be acceptable? Yes. That would Thank not, you. if they had done that, our argument loses its force, just to be clear. If they had said we all forms of games of chance authorized, or alternatively, as I hinted in the brief, if they had punted it to the legislature for them to decide time, place, and manner, and thus and such, that would not be asking my hypothetical voter in Pender to agree to only have it at racetracks. And that, and that would necessarily uh, trigger uh, the IGRA consequences about which you speak. Is that correct? It wouldn't, but it wouldn't have this. It wouldn't have the voter confusion issue because the voter would know that what she is voting on is the authorization, is the potential authorization of gambling statewide. So the geographic delineation, Justice Miller Lerman, to racetracks falls by the wayside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, please note that time is uh, flying. <clears throat> Mr. Spray, good morning or good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chief Justice and members of the court. Let me wash my hands. May it please the court. My name is J.L. Spray, and along with my partner, Joe Wilkins, we represent Mr. and Mrs. Todd Zoner, who are interveners in this matter. Uh, I want to argue there is a second insufficiency in the separate and distinct subjects of the constitutional amendment as well as each of the other initiatives, the regulatory initiative and the tax initiative. Because each of these initiates, initiate, initiatives violate the single subject provision, they each are, should not be put on the ballot as legally insufficient and this court must uh, affirm the decision of the Secretary of State and let it stand. As to the constitutional measure, the court brought much clarity to the issue, I think, in the uh, Luncher 2014 case, Luncher versus Gale, uh, in particular in part four, where it went into a, a laborious analysis of the decision by the legislature, including the uh, record of the legislature and their hearings, to put that issue on the ballot in 1998. And so I think you have a good record already of how it came to be, what it was meant to do, and what it does. And I would rely on Luncher versus Gale for that. Uh, the facts in Luncher versus Gale and the facts in North Platte versus Til Tilger, Tilsner are actually the closest facts to this case. And I want to stop here and make a distinction between Christensen and the case before you today. In Christensen, this court concluded that the supplemental issues involved in that uh, legislative initiative were so closely akin, maybe that was the word we use, akin, to the main purpose that it was acceptable and legally sufficient. In this case, the constitutional amendment has supplemental parts to it. It legalizes games of chance. It delegates to the legislature licensure, regulatory authority, and taxing authority. And then it goes that extra step and creates the monopoly. That's the part that creates the second issue. That's the part that is the second subject. And I don't think just hooking things together by connection and conjunction words like and this and that and this and that is sufficient. I think that there are two separate things for the voters to wonder about, to ask questions about, to wonder whether uh, they wouldn't really rather have it on a corner or at a convenience store, an arena, uh, but to be restricted take and give away is two separate steps. We give you all forms of gaming, we take away the location. We give the legislature authority, but then we take away and limit that authority all in the same step. And that's the part that we think crosses the line. Um, an example, and this goes to numerous questions that were asked, let's say the Medicaid expansion provision had an additional term to it, in addition to how it's gonna be funded it said, and uh, Humana had an exclusive monopoly as being the payee for the Medicaid program in Nebraska. Would it have been legally sufficient with that provision in it? Would that have been a supplement, something akin to the core purpose? This court has said this is not a linear exercise where if it all kind of seems to be the same subject, this court has said that we're going to examine these and be sure they're not two distinct issues put before the voter. Uh, well, is that grant of monopoly, as you characterize it, something that can be attacked should the voters approve these initiatives? Well, if it's in the Constitution, you'd have to attack it on you know, due process or some other, well, not due process, but equal protection probably. So yes, you could bring an action. But once it's in the Constitution, voted on by the people, it has a pretty high status. And I think that this court perhaps might not want to take away what the people have put in the Constitution. And that's, you know, the issue. This is the time to do this now. While but the but that, the is, that is really our exercise, is it not? And the frequently invoked, you know, precious right of initiative is let the people vote on it and they are expected to be reasonable and um, there's other provisions where they can become informed by way of pamphlet and so forth. So is the 
proposition, going back to the constitutional one, that would permit gaming in the racetrack. Is that, is that what's on the deck or on, on the table? Or, or you, you don't think that that phrase should be parsed? I think there's a precious right that the people have put in their constitution to be sure they don't vote on one thing in order to get another thing that they want. And that's what's going on here. They're voting on legalizing gambling, and they may or may not want to have it in horse tracks. They may think that's a dumb idea. But they well, don't they, have a they choice. Would, would they not leader. just vote against it be, because they might like gaming at the corner or something? But, but sh this is a larger question, and I do ask this in earnest. Aren't these to be taken up one at a time? That's how we've been uh, writing about split stuff up. They're split out. Correct. And again, if you put a period right before at uh, racetrack enclosures, you have everything that the voter might want to decide about gambling. That the legislature, that it's legal, that the legislature can regulate it, that the legislature can license it, that they can tax it. It's all oh, there. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't make my question clear. I meant to say that each initiative, is this correct, should be examined in and of itself and uh, without regard, for single, for singleness, <laughs> without regard to the existence of the other two, that, that we would take them up one at a time rather than how they might speak to each other. Thank and you. I, and I agree with that, Your Honor, but I would like to comment slightly further in that, I, well, I think Mr. Ebnan looked at him through that prism. None of his conclusions turned on that fact. And I think more importantly, all of the initiatives have the same flaw in them to the extent they all tie the hands of the public because the only way you can get games of chance is at licensed racetrack enclosures. Uh, I'd like to address one more thing and then I'll, I'll sit down. The uh, issue of whether there's a more lenient standard for initiatives that amend statutes versus initiatives that amend the Constitution, I think is completely blown away by the Part 5 of the Luncher versus Gale 2014 decision. In that case, it very clearly said that everything going on in Article 3, Section 2 is subject to that sentence that discusses the single subject. So, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. I was told to wash my hands again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, good morning or good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. So I, I think where I'd like to start is with this idea of reading the initiatives together. Um, really important to emphasize this point. When the Secretary read the initiatives together, he did so to determine their purpose and effect. And then he went on to engage in specific single subject analysis that could condemn each provision by itself. And so I think that's important to emphasize. So he did consider all of them together when assessing their purpose and effect. But the average voter is going to do the very same thing. They're going to look at these three measures and figure out what is this exactly doing? How does that interact well, with how this? are we to look at it? I think you should look at it when determining the purpose and effect the same way that he did. You can assess all of them together, determine how they inter interact with each other, and then for purposes of deciding the purpose and effect, take that into consideration. At that point, you move into the single subject analysis. We think, as we've provided in our brief, and as the Secretary explained, that the constitutional initiative and the regulatory initiative fall on their own terms. Now, when it comes to the taxation initiative, we think it's a little more complicated, and we think that should be read together with the regulatory uh, initiative, and that's for three reasons. The first reason is that they're an interconnected web. The second reason is you can't even make sense of the tax initiative without reading the regulatory initiative because it relies on concepts like an authorized gaming operator and a gaming commission that don't even come into being unless we have the regulatory initiative. And the last reason why you should read them together is because they both address related taxation issues. So the regulatory initiative grants a lucrative tax exemption to these new gaming operators. In contrast, you have the tax initiative, which is addressing another tax issue, and that is creating this annual gaming tax 
and requiring that to be paid and also determining how that will be distributed. So by addressing these same issues across measures, those measures have to be considered together for single subject purposes. And one of the points Mr. Barry said was that there's no authority for doing that. And, and I will admit that there is, it, it's a question that I don't see authority one way or the other. It's, it's an issue, certainly in Nebraska, of, of first impression. So what I would encourage the court is to look at that Luncher decision, the second one, the 2014, and specifically um, take note of the HUD versus Tim case that's discussed in there. Now that's a case from Wisconsin, and that's a case involving constitutional amendments that were legislatively initiated. But in discussing those, the court said that there were two separate amendments, but they had to be considered together. And specifically those amendments, one involved an attempt to convert the legislative session from an annual to a biannual, and the other one converted a legislator's uh, term from one year to two year. And if what the we, court- If we do read them together, do we definitely have law ruling? If you read the regulatory initiative with the tax initiative, you absolutely have law ruling. I don't think there's a question about that. I think it falls squarely within the 2014 Luncher decision. Because you what have- What is your definition of log rolling? Must the log rolling occur in, in and within the boundaries of one initiative? So the, the concept of log rolling is a very broad concept generally. Now, as this court has talked about it, it has talked about rolling distinct issues into one measure. So certainly that's been what this court has contemplated, but it's never faced a situation like this. And so under these circumstances, again, this is a unique situation where you have this, these interconnected statutory initiatives, you have them at both addressing related tax issues, and you can't even make sense of one of them without the other one because they rely so much on the same concepts that under these unique circumstances, they should be read together. Are Mr. we reaping today what we sowed in Lutcher too? I, the secretary faithfully applied Luncher too. So if you want to characterize it that way, I, I think that this court laid out a, a three-prong test and it treated each of those prongs as, as distinct. Is there a single subject problem? Is there voter confusion? Or is there doubt about the effect after the election? And that's been the test that was stated there. It was the test stated in, in uh, City of North Platte and it's also been built up in some of the municipal cases as well. Is there something that you want to say about the natural and necessary connection in the constitutional initiative between all games of chance and licensed racetracks? We agree with what Mr. Spray said. I mean, that, that argument, we think that there, there is not a natural and necessary connection. And, and one thing I would point out that, that wasn't mentioned before is that the regulatory initiative actually creates a separate commission to deal with these issues. In other words, it doesn't just give all of these issues to the existing racing commission, which you would think they would do if these issues were intertwined. Rather, it creates a separate gaming commission. The very fact that it's doing that is an implicit recognition that these are distinct matters that need to be distinct, that need to be addressed differently. So, so that's so your view, have. if I may, your view of the, of the, of the law uh, was that in Luchner in 2014 that the scope of the secretary's duties was not merely to check for single subject, but rather was to evaluate if this would confuse the, the voters and mislead the voters and things of that nature, which are number two and number three in the municipal setting. And um, one of you all, I think, referred to, wouldn't it be odd if, you know, if, the, if in connection with single subject, which had it been one, but not two or three, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be ironic, you know, at the constitutional level, if single subject didn't have a definition? So I'm still kind of back where I was 45 minutes ago about our, our law and, whether, and, and perhaps that all we did by referring to the municipal cases was to say, here's how you do it with municipal initiatives generated by statutes and not necessarily adopted. Is this confusing? So says the secretary or this court and so forth. So that, what is, what's your view on that which was actually written in, in Luchner? Thanks. Sure. So one thing I would, I would point the court to is something else written in Luchner. And that is that the, the impetus 
for adding the single subject language in 1998 to Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution was the concern with, and this is a quote, voter confusion and fraud in the initiative process. So Luchner already considered and contemplated the fact that that was the whole impetus for putting this language in. So it would sure be odd to now pull that out of the analysis when it was the very thing that brought that about. Were, I see I'm were out these, of time. I'm were these three answer. initiatives, the signature gathering, were they done collectively? Um, I, I personally don't know the answer to that, Your Honor. No, but if they all pass, they'd all be on the same voting ballot. That's correct. That's correct. In terms of whether they were circulated by the same signature gatherers, that, that I, I simply don't know. What, what, if I may add one thing bef just before I sit down, it's not even a substantive point. On Quickly. page 12 of our brief, if, if that's all right, Your Honor. You may wrap up. On page 12 of our brief, we say that the constitutional initiative permits, quote, some entities at some locations in Nebraska to establish class three gaming. What we actually should have said there is that the regulatory initiative does that. And that just gets to Mr. Barry's point about the difference between the constitutional initiative authorizes the enactment of statutes, but it's the regulatory um, provision itself that creates the, the authorization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we Thank have you. time for a rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, nine minutes and 49 seconds. Nine minutes and 49 seconds. Mr. Barry. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to hit a few points that were raised uh, in the arguments of counsel for the last 30 minutes or so. First of all, in Luncher, this court really did clearly deal with the question of multiple provisions. And it answered that by the, the touchstone for that is, is there a separate vote? Um, what the court held in describing log rolling is that the problem at the heart of log rolling is requiring voters to vote for or against distinct propositions in a single vote. Those are the words. And Luncher also held that the way that the legislature, that was a legislatively proposed initiative, the way the legislature should have addressed that issue was, and this is a quote, to present the proposals to the voters for separate votes. That's what the sponsors did here. That's what these three initiatives do. Um, and we go through in our brief all the different permutations that you how, can think how about. How do you address Mr. Campbell's argument that particularly the regulatory uh, provision and the taxing provision are intertwined? Well, they certainly refer to each other. Um, but someone who, but, but the touchstone for Luncher is, do I have to vote for the regulatory initiative if I like the tax initiative? The answer is no, I don't have to. Now, maybe we get into one of those questions that not, that's not justiciable at this point is, well, what is, what's the effect of the tax petition in that circumstance? And I don't want to spend a lot of time speculating on what that would, what that would look like. But the voters can vote separately on each of these. And one possible outcome, Your Honor, is that they approve both of them. And if they approve both of them, that concern is, is moot because the voters do, did approve both. So I think we've, uh, that the sponsors here clearly met the requirements of Luncher. Um, I don't think that it's odd uh, for the single subject rule as a constitutional rule to be based on its plain, straightforward language. So I don't, I don't think that there is anything odd about that to address some of the comments that, that have been made here. I want to uh, touch on one of the words that, that Mr. Spray used. There's no monopoly for these expanded games of chance. Um, there isn't, this isn't Humana, one specific company that's been picked to run the games of chance. What, what the constitutional initiative would do is limit those games to certain types of facilities, racetracks, um, but no one's prohibited from building a new racetrack. Um, it's just that it's a certain type of facility. That's the way that that public policy limit finds expression in the constitutional initiative. Is there a reason why Kino, Hall, Kino Halls weren't included? Um, I was not part of the drafting, so I can't tell you why. But I would say that racetracks require a pretty significant investment in order to get to get going. There are probably going to be fewer of them, and so my guess is um, you've got more regulation, and you've got fewer 
locations, and that's something that the sponsors of the initiative. How many are there? Um, I would, I could look back to one of my clients, and they would tell, they would tell me exactly. I think, I'm going to say three or four in Nebraska right now. They're all Grand Island East, correct? Um, I think that is correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, and I know the court didn't, didn't rule on this case. What about but, the argument that there is no natural connection to racetracks because you're setting up a different regulatory agency than the regulatory agency that governs gambling for racetracks? Well, I think there's the natural connection is that both of them involve gaming and gambling, and that's just, it, it's a location where those types of activities can take place. And I think it's again, a reasonable policy solution to say, we're not gonna have the, the racing commission, which is staffed with people who know horses and horse racing and, and force that group of people to get up to speed on uh, a type of gaming that is, uh, you know, it's, it's not horse racing. There's, there's gonna be a difference there, but they're both forms of gaming. In our constitution right now, we have a constitutional provision that relates to all forms of gaming. So to say, uh, under Christensen or Luncher that we're going to reduce the our definition of what the primary purpose is to something below that constitutional level that we already have, which is games of chance, I think is really problematic for the people because it tells the people this provision that's been in the Constitution since 1875 and you're the masters of the Constitution, you know what? You can't deal with it. At least you can't deal with it in a single initiative. You've got to break it up because we think that there are separate subjects in the way the Constitution is already provided. So I, I think that's a problematic argument that the opponents are making, uh, problematic for them. And I, I wanted to address the importance of the ability to impose some limits in having constitutional initiatives passed. Because one of the ramifications of the arguments you've heard is to get something on the ballot, you just have to say, we're not gonna limit it to racetracks, okay? It's just gotta be, the doors have to be flung wide open. That's another limit on the ability of, of the people to propose rational policy solutions to issues. And an example I would give is the constitutional right to hunt and fish. That right doesn't say that every Nebraskan has an unqualified right to hunt and fish. That's qualified even as a matter of the constitutional language in that provision. And for good reason. It probably would not have gotten as many votes if it, if it had been an unqualified right. So the people have flexibility in proposing and voting on these uh, these constitutional issues, are, are you in that example tying uh, tying the con a constitutional provision uh, that that there are constitutional provisions with prepositional de phrases describing them? That's correct, Your Honor. And and some of those constitutional provisions originated with the people under the single subject. Our Constitution belongs to the people. And under the Constitution, the ultimate duty to evaluate policy arguments, including the policy arguments that have made their way into this court today, and the ultimate decision on whether to authorize games of chance is up to the people of Nebraska. If the opponent's arguments become the law of this court, there will be collateral effects for the initiative process, and they will not be good. There will be more roadblocks to the initiative and referendum, more litigation, and endless arguments in this court, perhaps to the Secretary of State, perhaps in district court, about voter confusion and collateral effects. The relators respectfully suggest that the correct approach is for the court to adhere to its precedents and the seven straightforward words in the single subject rule. Those words in our Constitution dictate that the three measures before the court, each of which contains only one subject, be presented to voters for separate votes at the next general election. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes arguments for this afternoon. The court is adjourned, and you are consequently excused. Please, when you are leaving you. the courtroom, go out the side door and distance yourselves, if at all possible. That includes both the lawyers and those uh, spectators in the audience. And again, thank you very much for participating this afternoon.
and for abiding by our coronavirus rules. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.